in 2007, uh, the City of Toronto and uh, Chicago were competing for the greenest city in North America, and everything, every time you turned on the news or picked up a paper was about water, energy, the environment. And in the business I was in at the time, I was trying to convince uh, landscape contractors, so people that install and maintain irrigation systems, I was trying to convince them to buy new products that are coming to the market that could really reduce water use significantly, and none of them believed in water conservation and all their job was get things wet, keep things green, and just move on to the next job. And so I thought there was an opportunity uh, and, and took a gamble and started a company focused on using those technologies. And just fundamentally, I believe that uh, if you think about what we're doing with the drinking water, we're, we're putting it on lawns and we're putting it on sidewalks and roads. And uh, it, it may, may, not, may not be the best use of our most precious resource. Um, I was shocked to find out that conservation wasn't the norm, and after about a year into it, I realized I'd really underestimated that uh, there really was a thirst for conservation out there, and that was something that we could do as a company to help deliver some, some things. So uh, I just wanted to kind of poll the audience here, but do any of you have an op opinion of irrigation systems? Has anyone here seen a system watering in the rain? I see a couple nodding heads. How does it make you feel? <laughs> Frustrated, mad, yeah. Uh, that's why I like, well, I do, it's fun. Uh, this is a couple things about uh, our industry. So uh, turf grass, it's the single largest crop in North America. Covers a lot of area, and it's three times larger than the second largest, which is corn. So that, inclu that includes, uh, you know, residential lots, commercial buildings, golf courses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the EPA estimates that there are over 34 billion liters per day of potable water used uh, to water that crop, so water lawns, and 50, as much as 50 percent uh, is wasted. So I believe this is a significant opportunity in our industry. Uh, I love this quote, water isn't becoming scarce, it's, it's just not where we're used to finding it. Uh, there's a great book called The Big Thirst, if you're into water, that's a couple years old, but it's still uh, relevant, I think. Uh, and really, it's sort of alluding to the fact that climate change is changing uh, our watersheds. And it's changing the water available to us. Uh, maybe not to us that are on the shores of Lake Ontario, but the other communities in Ontario and in Canada are seeing changes to their water supply because of climate change. So reduced snowpack, things like that. I don't know if anyone's been to Las Vegas and seen Lake Mead. It's, uh, it's pretty scary. 30 years ago, they said they had 50 years of supply left on Lake Mead and it wasn't an issue. And now they're saying, well, it's 10 years away. It, it's, it, things are happening a, a lot quicker than people anticipated. And it's because of uh, climate change and reduced snow melt and uh, I increased intensification of people living in cities that maybe they shouldn't be living in. Uh, so we've seen what's happened with California. Not only is it sort of uh, really affected how people water their lawns, but it's also a $7 billion impact to an agricultural economy. And it's going to impact us because we're paying a lot more for things like almonds and fruits that come uh, from those areas. Uh, there's a large aquifer under Nebraska, sort of central US, that uh, has always been a source of water for agriculture. And uh, it was never really an issue, but uh, studies that they've done to identify that that aquifer is replacing, uh, replacing or replenishing itself at less than 5% a year, uh, it's a problem because eventually it's going to run out. The solution used to be just drill a deeper well, but we're getting near the bottom. So there's going to be a lot of things that change uh, with water and how we think about water. Uh, the cost to pump and treat water uh, is, is rising. It's something that's called the energy water nexus. So there's this convergence of it need, takes a lot of energy to treat and pump water, uh, so it produces a lot of pollution. And in uh, Ontario, on average, for every cubic meter, there's about uh, 0 0.09 kilograms of CO2 emissions uh, for water that we're treat when we're treating and pumping it. The industry I'm in, landscape ir irrigation, uh, is typically it's a it's a peak uh, season seasonal business, May to uh, September, uh, but it is the single largest contributor to something called peak day water demand. Peak day water demand is the water demand on a water system that happens after two weeks of dry weather uh, with no rain and it's when people are watering their lawns and when automate, automatic irrigation systems uh, are, are running. And the reason why it's important is it's how our engineers size all of our infrastructure. It's sort of like building a 20-lane uh, 401 
for when we really only need that 20 lanes for about an hour in the morning and an hour at night. It just doesn't happen, but that's what's happening with water systems. They're building systems to handle that peak, uh, peak demand. We know that water rates are going to continue to rise as we need to fund, uh, fund infrastructure. Like City of uh, Toronto has over a billion dollars in infrastructure replacements planned, and that number is just growing every day. I'm sure you see water main breaks in the news quite frequently because some of these water pipes are 100 years older or, or longer. The other thing that's happened is water use per capita. So the amount of water that you and I use per day it is decreasing, and that's a good thing uh, for our, for our uh, I guess, supply of water, source of water, but it's not a good thing for water department's uh, revenues. So in, in our business, uh, we deal with a lot of corporate clients, and these are people that are implement, implementing water conservation initiatives based on their corporate sustainability practices. So people are noticing that it's important to their tenants it's important to their, the people that own the buildings, and they're trying to reduce their, uh, their operating costs by through lower water bills, lower energy bills, et cetera. Uh, we are seeing more conservation programs coming to market uh, because if they can reduce that peak day demand, they don't need to build as big an infrastructure and it saves them some money. It's also just not uh, acceptable uh, for corp corporations to be seen as wasteful. So that includes energy, garbage, water. Uh, stormwater surcharges are something else that is a new reality, and I'll touch a little bit about that in uh, a bit further on. There's a great uh, survey that RBC does every couple of years. There's probably a more up-to-date one, but in 2012, 48% 40, of Canadians said that the, the, the things that upset them the most is watering lawns during, after, or just after it rains, and I'd agree with that. So I'm going to talk about landscape irrigation system. Essentially what it is, is it's an extension of your plumbing system in your house. It's a series of pipes, uh, they're under the ground, and they've got tons of fixtures on them. Like this is a fixture, that's a sprinkler. That uses about eight liters a minute. And there's probably about 30 of them on a small house. So think about that, that's, that's a lot of water using fixtures. Uh, that uses potable water, so drinking water. It's an unregulated industry. Uh, usually the cheapest price wins for in terms of installation. Uh, in a commercial setting, these systems flow at about 120 liters a minute. That's the water source that's going out into the landscape. Uh, and an average commercial site is around two to five million liters a year. So I'll just quickly talk about fix fixtures for a, sec uh, for a second. So when I talk to some of our commercial customers about what an irrigation system really is, they've never really thought of it as an extension of their plumbing or part of their infrastructure. It's just something that's there. They don't see it and the grass is green or it's not. But really, if you've got 100 of these on a site using 8 liters a minute, and if you're not scheduling it properly, it's a big problem. One, just one of these sprinklers is going to use 50,000 liters of water a year. So it runs for 8 liters a minute, 20, 20 minutes a night, four days a, four days a week for 25 weeks. That adds, adds up to just over 50,000 liters. The problem is that um, this model right here is what I would call an ultra-low flush toilet. So you've probably all... Uh, replace your toilets with low flush toilets because the cities have given incentives to do this. Well, what's out there right now is the old 13 liter flush toilet. So the old systems, there's millions of these things literally out there on the ground in the GTA right now that are using way more water than they need to be because the newer products that can just be put in place are going to use 30 to 40 percent less water and do the same thing. So uh, these are, I talk about these as fixtures and we spend a lot of time in our business go taking over uh, older irrigation systems and completely replacing all of the fixtures and infrastructure and, and achieving some significant water savings. How much water does the system use? So everyone's probably heard that you don't need to apply more than one inch a week to keep your landscape healthy in the summer. What that works out to is if you were to apply an inch of water over an acre, it's around uh, 100,000 liters a, a week. Over a, a season, that's about 2 million liters a year. Now that's assuming that every uh, drop of water that is coming uh, out of the system onto the lawn is landing there. In reality, irrigation systems are typically less than 50% efficient. They're just, things are blowing away in the wind, they're not properly installed, there's leaks, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to actually keep your landscape healthy and you want to have that one inch a week, uh, you now need 4 million liters a year to do so. And that's where the water is going. So we spend a lot of time turning systems on, uh, doing uh, water use inspections. We have we developed our own software to do that because we need that information to try to convince a property manager or owner that they need to make an investment in conservation. 
And sometimes when you show them, show them these pictures, they get it. That's a picture of an overpressurized system. There's a leak. And you notice the grass is green there. That's going to stay there. If it, if it rains occasionally, that's going to stay there and stay green, and no one's going to know about it unless there's some technology in place that can detect a leak. And that's one of the things we do. And sometimes people are really shocked when they see these pictures because people that own these systems are property managers. They don't go out in the middle of the night and turn these things on and, and see where the water is going. They just assume if everything looks okay that it's fine. It's, and it's funny, I get calls from people after we've made some changes on their system saying the system's not running. And then I said, well, why do you think that? Well, there's no water in the parking lot. I'm used to coming into the, <laughs> the parking lot in the morning and there's puddles. So that's how I know it ran. So it's sort of changing opinions. So kind of getting back on topic of this myth of water abundance in Canada. Uh, I, I kind of I thought about this a little bit, and I thought, well, I don't, when I when I water my lawn, when I take a shower, when I turn on the tap, I'm never concerned about water. I think we're very fortunate where we live, uh, and we don't have an immediate water scarcity issue. That's not why I'm in business. Why I do these things, um, but there are places that are groundwater fed, like Kitchener Waterloo, uh, places like Metro Vancouver that are re reliant on a supply that's maybe 100 miles away up in the mountains in the form of snow, and they're relying on snowpack to fill reservoirs. So uh, we don't have, I think, an immediate water scarcity problem here. We've probably got the opposite. Uh, but in some areas of Canada and globally, w water is a huge issue. So why? Should we conserve or why should we want to conserve? Well, uh, obviously it's going to save us money. Uh, reduce pollution by reducing en energy demand. In the, in the summer months, the city of Toronto, a 30% of the city of Toronto's energy usage is for pumping and treating water. We want to ensure a supply for future generations. I myself have two, two kids and it's something I think about is, geez, when I look at the news and see what's going on in other parts of the world, I feel pretty fortunate about where we live. But it's something that you know I want to play a role in making sure that we use it responsibly. Uh, corporate sustain sustainability initiatives, uh, they like ha you know their tenants like to live in green buildings, and that's something they like to talk about that how they're a good a good corporate citizen and, and water conservation is one of them, and it, it feels good to do it. Here's a kind of a snapshot. Water rates are kind of all over the board, but if you look down at the bottom there, in 2005, when I was thinking about starting this business, water rates in Toronto are $1.35, and soon they're going to be $4. So water conservation really starts to make a lot of sense, and one of the best conservation measures implemented by water utilities is water rate increases. So the impact on operating budgets, if you've got a corporate campus, it used to cost $5,400 a year to water an acre, now it's over $13,000. So when I, the title of this was sort of Rethinking Landscapes and How We Use Water. Uh, now uh, we do a lot of consulting uh, for landscape architects who are designing uh, new properties. And almost everything that we design now is somehow linked to a rainwater system. And Landscapes are being designed now to manage water use. They used to be designed to get water away from the building, and now they're designed to retain water. Uh, the Toronto Green Building Standards are something that are, you know, uh, I guess promoting that as well, because it is a requirement. There's other green building standards like LEED that also talk about rainwater collection and reduce uh, water use. Uh, plant, our customers are putting in a different plant palette now. They're, uh, changing what they plant to something that's less water intensive. Uh, the other thing that's really exciting is technology uh, is changing that allows us to control resources. So technology is finally caught up in our business and allows us to, uh, to control resource use usage. There's also municipal programs, uh, certification programs that are trying to foster market transformation. So we do a lot of retrofits where we're replacing plant, ma plant material uh, and we're actually changing how things are irrigated. That retrofit there was a 267,000 liter savings. And some of these buildings, there's not a lot of things they can do to find that level of savings. That's a green building. That's rainwater. And this is what happened when we went to inspect it and when we turned it on. So they've got a rainwater tank. Uh, they're just, it's an overpressurized system, and half the water is landing in the parking lot. Uh, that's the same building. And uh, we worked to retrofit this irrigation system, it was two years old. That's the amazing thing. It's two years old and we had to completely retrofit it, but 
we did, and we saved about 500,000 liters in a year, and uh, ourselves and uh, Bentall Kennedy, who's the property manager, won an award for that. So sometimes the best intent, so a native planting and a parking lot median uh, is a great intent, but when they put in the water delivery system, it's not well done, and that's what happens. So the other way that uh, there's, there's savings potential in our industry is how things are scheduled. Typically, things are set up to run uh, the same in May. So they set, a contractor will set it up to run in May, and they'll come back in October to turn it off. And the problem is that the water requirement of the landscape changes every day. If it's a cloudy day, overcast day, there's really no water requirement, but it'll water anyway. So uh, technologies are changing that allow controllers to automatically adjust their schedules. Uh, flow sensors are something that are out there that allow us to detect leaks and shut down things remotely. So that's a leak. Uh, this, you know, this is what we do. We provide our clients with data on a water use or, uh, that they never looked at before. They might know they use 5 million liters a year, but they never knew, well, should we be using 2 million? So uh, that's really what we specialize in. And this is one thing that excites me is the connected home. And in our industry right now, there's a big shift uh, towards these nest type products, so thermostats. Uh, I brought an example of one. So this is a, equivalent to uh, a nest for water. This can go in your home, runs by Wi-Fi. You can control it from your phone, from your computer, and it links automatically to weather stations. It'll decide when to skip your irrigation. And the savings potential from these technologies are, are huge. And these, did not, these are not coming from the major uh, manufacturers in the industry. They're coming from startup companies in California who got really upset about seeing sprinklers watering in the rain and decided to come up with a product. So it's, it's kind of neat. I'll kind of skip through some of these because we're running short of time. Um, you can control it from your computer. It integrates with home automation systems. You can talk to it now. Uh, you can tell Amazon's Alexa to water your front yard for 10 minutes and it'll integrate with this unit and do it. So stormwater management is the other thing I want to talk about. So thinking about our landscapes as a retention tool, uh, we're seeing the region of uh, Peel has implemented a stormwater surcharge. A lot of our clients are, uh, are facing significant, uh, like $20,000 new charges this year. Because unless they figure out a way to retain 50% of the stormwater uh, that falls on their landscape. So they're, they're looking at the landscapes now, uh, they're putting in swales, they're putting in rainwater uh, collection systems. Uh, we think the future is probably going to integrate rainwater uh, and gray water as well. And if you think about it, if you, have, uh, if you have a landscape with good soil and it's losing two inches of water a week through evapotranspiration, uh, that's about 200,000 liters a week that one acre could absorb. So that's a huge, uh, a huge volume of water. And we know from the last few years in the city of Toronto, there's been, I think, two or three hundred year storm events, and it's caused some major issues. And that's why these things are all kind of gathering momentum. I, I'll quickly flip through these. Uh, just different types of rainwater systems available. There's modular systems, uh, you know, with, combined with water features. We've built some of these. Um, for residential applications. Those are traditional commercial kind of concrete cisterns. The problem with rainwater collection is it's very expensive. The cost per liter of retention is about two to five dollars, could be more. The cost of water is two one hundredths of a cent right now for potable water. So water costs have to come up significantly, but things like stormwater surcharges are helping as well. Uh, there's obviously concerns about uh, safety and cross-contamination of potable and non-potable water and maintenance costs. You know, we don't think about maintenance costs when we turn on the tap. Uh, you have to start thinking about that if you've got a, a gray water or a rainwater system at your home or business. So our relationship for water is changing. Uh, we can look, we're probably going to be charged more for certain uses of water, uh, things like watering your lawn. We may be charged based on when we use water. So if we use it during peak energy demand times, we might be charged more. So people are going to be filling up tanks in low demand times and then using it at different times. Uh, we can expect a much higher cost of water. Uh, with technologies like this, we're going to have access at our fingertips to our resource use, water and energy. And there's no doubt that our relationship with water is changing. Thank you for uh, listening to me today. That was great. Thanks, Chris. And Lloyd, I invite you up to uh, take his place. Good 
Okay, thank you very much. So thanks, Taylor, for inviting me to participate in this session. I changed my title from a very boring title to something maybe a bit more exciting called Conserve Water and Change the World. And before we get started, I want to tell you about something we've come across that did an amazing job at conserving water and changed the world. And I'll tell you right now, this little guy, if you haven't guessed already, is of course a donut. <laughs> now, I'll tell you why um, this guy changed the world later on, but you'll have to pay attention to my presentation before I get to it. <laughs> So it's a little hook to get you involved. So I come from Enviro Stewards. It's an environmental engineering firm. We're located in the water, Waterloo area. We help our clients increase their profits by identifying ways to save water, conserve energy, reduce waste. We help them sustain the environment by keeping those savings going. And we also um, look for ways to benefit society. And I'll touch on that just a little bit because I think it would be of interest to this crowd. So, um, our company is a certified B Corporation, so that means we're certified to be beneficial to the environment and society. And actually, Chris, your company as well is certified B Corporation. We're part of Sustainable Waterloo Region, which means we've set targets for reducing our greenhouse gas uh, footprint. And also we're part of Living Wage Waterloo Region, which means we pay a minimum of $16 to any of our staff, whether they're co-ops or the person who cleans the office. And we're also involved with the Safe Drinking Water Project. It's a not-for-profit of ours in East Africa, and I'll also touch on that a bit later. So let's start from a global perspective on water. Um, a recent report puts it quite bluntly. I'll allow you to read the full quote there, but I really like that part at the bottom that there's, there's no substitute for water. Um, you know, we all share it, we need it to live, and therefore I think it's all our responsibility to, to care for it. Water issues already growing concern in the news. Uh, Chris mentioned some concerns in the States, but especially internationally, uh, water scarcity is a huge concern. And I imagine we'll be seeing more and more headlines like these ones on the screen in the coming years. When you factor in climate change, it's not too hard to imagine some dystopian future where there's some dictator who opens and closes the water valve to his people. And I don't know if everybody got this reference, but of course that's a Morton Joe who said that from Mad Max. But science fiction aside, water scarcity and access to safe water is it's a reality for a lot of the population in the world. So Peter, people like Peter and Jogo, who live in South Sudan, um, access to, to safe water is actually a, a matter of life and death. And I like to start discussions like this because I'm very passionate about water, but I'm also very passionate about making sure that people who don't have our resources have access to safe drinking water wherever they live. So let's zoom into Canada. So again, a recent report ranked us 15th out of 16th amongst peer countries for water conservation. So it looks like lo or nationally, at least, there's a lot that we can still do. Zooming into Ontario, um, one of the strains on our water resources is just our growing population. So the, the GTA, for example, is expected to grow by almost 40% by 2036. And so when you have a growing population, they need water. So you need to provide water to those people. One way that you can do that is to just build more infrastructure. So build more water treatment systems, build more pipes, more pumps to get that water to more people. Or you can take the conservation approach. So reduce, reuse, and recycle the existing water capacity. And there are actually government programs that I'll talk about that pay people to reduce water because it's actually cheaper to pay people to use less water than it is to build, than it is to build new infrastructure. So I'll just touch on a few in Ontario, Waterloo, Toronto, Guelph, and York Region. And for this presentation, I'll specifically focus on Toronto in a few slides. But they offer some sort of free water audit to facilities, businesses in their regions. So we're retained by City of Waterloo, City of Guelph, and York Region to go into businesses and find ways for them to reduce water. And that's a free service to the client. So they pay us to do that, the region does, and the businesses get that audit for free. If businesses implement something, so say they changed out a water-cooled equipment for an air-cooled equipment, the regions will also pay them some money based on the water that they saved. Toronto's programs, they have two separate ones. One's called the industrial water rate, and that one's just for industrial companies. And the capacity buyback program, which is for commercial institutional facilities, so you know, hospitals, hotels, schools, colleges, universities. For Toronto's industrial water rate program, the water audit must be completed by a professional engineer. And any opportunity that is found to save water that has a payback of five years or less, it, it must be implemented under their program. There's also verification visits to make sure that the equipment's being installed and is saving the water that it was said it was going to save. 
And if facilities do this and get on the industrial water rate program, they're entitled to a water rate that's 30% less than the standard rate. So that's a significant savings for, for companies, especially when the price is going to increase to $4 a cubic meter in a few years. For the capacity buyback program, it's a little bit different. Again, it has to be a professional engineer that conducts the audit. And any permanent process change that results in water savings can be eligible for an incentive. So again, the city of Toronto, if you install something, it saves you water, they will pay you 30 cents per liter that you saved um, based on um, the assessment. So again, these are really big incentives for, for businesses to help keep them in Toronto and attract more business to Toronto by offering these types of programs. So it's, it's an economic um, benefit, but it also helps conserve the existing water capacity that Toronto has. So how do you actually do an audit? What's involved? Well. The most important step is collecting reliable data. So whether it's using you know, ultrasonic flow meters or just bucket and stopwatch measurements, you want to collect accurate data because it allows you to do accurate before and after comparisons. So in this example, um, before they're using about 120 gallons per minute using a certain type of spray nozzle. They switched to a higher efficiency spray nozzle and they use less than 20 gallons per minute. Because there's good accurate data, you can make a very good calculation about how much money they should get back based on the water savings. Once you've collected your data and you know where the water is being used in the facility, you want to prioritize it. It's called a Pareto analysis. So you want to focus on processes A, B, and C because you're going to get much better opportunities for saving water than if you focused on F, G, and H, for example. Once you know where most of your water is being used, then you can start brainstorming ideas to reduce that water consumption. And the final step, and the very important one, is to bring it down to a business case. You know, companies say they want to be environmentally friendly. They want to save water, but at the end of the day, they're there to make money. So if there's not an economic incentive to do something, often it doesn't get implemented. So bring it down to business case. So in this example, maybe $70,000 to install a cooling tower. The annual savings, operation maintenance savings are $50,000. It's 1.3 year payback. That's a pretty good investment for a company to make that saves water and also makes a good business case. So that's a key step in this whole process. Let's look at a case study of how this works in reality. Um, this one is about Fruition Fruits and Fills, which is owned by Tim Hortons. And you probably guess what's coming next. Here's our donut that we saw at the beginning. So we went into Fruition and looked at where they were using uh, water and found that most of their water was being used to clean the fondant machine. So the fondant makes those nice thick icings that go on top of donuts. And when we first started, basically they just pour water into the machine and dump it out pour it on the machine, dump it out until the water came out clean, then they would do the next batch of icing. So they used a lot of water in this process. We worked with their team to basically switch them from a batch process to a continuous process. So instead of making a flavor, cleaning it, making the next flavor, cleaning it, they'd have a one raw, long run of the same flavor, or they'd go from light to dark, so they wouldn't have to switch out and clean it every single time. So that went from, they were cleaning every 16 hours previously, to only having to clean that once per week. So that's a really huge water savings. Another interesting thing in the plant was, you notice the icing sugar on the floor. So their workers would take those craft bags of sugar, go up the stairs, slit them open, pour them into the mixing vessels. And as you can see, they didn't always hit the target. And there's always icing sugar on the floor, which meant that people always had hoses washing that down the sewer. Again, really high water use. And also wet floors are not good for health and safety either. So again, we worked with them to move to a super sack system. A super sack is just a, a gigantic bag of icing sugar. And they hard piped it to the vessel so that there was no way for the icing sugar to get on the ground. So when there's no more icing sugar on the ground, there's no more water that's needed to wash it down the sewer, and your, and your floors are dry as well, which is safer. So just the water savings alone was almost $100,000 per year for this facility. And it's, it's only a 40-person facility as well. It's a very small one. And they also did energy and looked at uh, waste reduction as well. And they actually saved close to half a million dollars overall in this assessment. There's also a very interesting social aspect to this story because the plant manager at the time decided to donate a percentage of the savings um, to, to sponsor the construction of biosand filters in South Sudan. So those are those blue filters on the screen there. And they're currently providing about 800,000 liters per year of, of safe drinking water to communities in South Sudan. So this case study with Tim Hortons was a great example where there were economic savings, 
Um, there's a reduced environmental footprint, and there's also a very compelling social story as well. And in fact, a few years ago, they won a National Sustainability Award for, for that project. So that's how donuts change the world. <laughs> so just to recap briefly, um, there's some great government programs in Ontario. They save businesses money. They help preserve our existing water resources so we don't have to use more water for our, for our cities. And also there are benefits to society for everybody when there's less water being used for our purposes. And again, water is an amazing substance. There's no substitute. Uh, we share it with our global neighbors. And as we saw in the Tim Hortons example, you know, local water conservation activities can have a ripple effect to benefit people globally, like we saw in the case study you went through lastly there. If you'd like to learn a bit more about some of the topics I covered, there are a few resources there. On the safewaterproject.org, that's our not-for-profit um, project I talked about. Cost.org, um, it's located in Calgary, and they have some really great information on how, how those biosand filters work. I didn't get into those today because it's kind of a bit technical, but if you want to learn more about them, it's a great resource. Uh, City of Toronto, we can Google, Google them and their programs to learn more about their water conservation efforts. And as well, if you want to learn more about what we do, our website is on, on there as well. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Lloyd. That was great. Now there's uh, even more reasons to eat donuts guilt-free, so I'm really happy about that development as well. <laughs> Um, Natalia, i turn it over to you as our last speaker. All right, so thank you for... Uh, okay, I need to adjust a little bit. I'm not as tall. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be here today, uh, Taylor. I'm going to be speaking a bit about water quantity, water quality, and water availability through the lens of Environmental Defense's water program. So to begin, when we talk about water security, we think about water scarcity. So we think about uh, the lack of water, and that's basically when our demand exceeds the supply. But what do we need that water for? Are we drinking it? Are we bathing with it? Are we irrigating? And what quality of water do we need for these activities? For instance, does the quality of water that we need for drinking equate to the quality of water that we use for flushing the toilet? And what's the water quality that we also need to think about when it comes to our ecosystems, um, not just our health? So I'm getting a bit wonky there. So at Environmental Defense, a Great Lakes program looks at uh, working towards implementing strong, effective legislation and policy, keeping phosphorus at its lakes, so phosphorus is a fertilizer, which is great on the fields, it helps grow our crops, but in the lakes, it's pollution. And then putting a price on plastic pollution, uh, specifically water bottles, which I'll get to in a bit. So there's agreements and legislation currently in place that create a policy framework that supports this ethic of water stewardship. One example is the Great Lakes Lawrence River Basin Sustainable Water Resource Agreement that was signed by eight Great Lakes states and the province of Ontario and Quebec. So this is basically a framework to talk about water diversions and water quantity issues. And then there's the Water Opportunities and Water Conservation Act, which was passed in 2010. And then this helps promote water conservation plans at the municipal scale while also creating a clean tech sector within Ontario and to promote the kind of technologies that we heard um, both uh, Chris and Lloyd speak about earlier. So this is just to give you an example of how the policy can influence uh, water conservation. And now, um, there's the Waukesha Diversion, which you may have heard of in the news. Now, this is the first test case of the agreement that I just mentioned. There's a municipality um, in Wisconsin that's looking to increase their water supply. They say that they have exhausted all alternatives, um, and they like to draw about 10.1 million gallons of water per day. The trouble is, this is a municipality that is just outside the Great Lakes Basin, and therefore it's a test to the agreement. Um, so environmental defense, what we're trying to ask and what we'd like you to help, help um, ask the Premier to do as well is to oppose this diversion. The decision will be pending um, in the spring. Uh, though Ontario doesn't have the ability to deny Waukesha's request, this is something that rests with the compact, which is basically a similar agreement to that that I mentioned, but without both uh, Quebec and Ontario being present. What Ontario can do, as can Quebec, is to review the, the proposal by the um, municipality. And 
as an independent report has found, there are alternatives um, to expanding their municipal water supply. They could treat the water um, at less of a cost than diverting it from uh, Lake Michigan. So one thing that you can do is you can go right on our website and sign the petition. Or better yet, as Kirsten was saying, you can also go speak at public hearings. Um, the second issue I'd like to talk about is algal blooms in Lake Erie. So this year, we had the most severe of the century, according to NOAA. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the reasons why there's algal blooms is because of too much fertilizer. But it could also be because of leaking uh, septic systems, because of combined sewer overflows, um, and other municipal sources as well. And luckily, there's also legislation and agreements in place from the federal down to the provincial level, and most recently, the Great Lakes Protection Act that looks at creating a legislative framework that enables both the federal government and the provinces to take action towards reducing phosphorus pollution within Lake Erie. Environmental Defense released a report back in 2014, and we looked at four different things that could be done to tackle this issue. So one was creating the policy framework. Um, and that still needs to be implemented. So though the act is passed, there's still work that needs to be done. There's building water smart cities and cultivating water smart citizens. So we just heard some terrific examples from our earlier panelists. Improving science on why blooms happen um, and understanding their implications. So for instance, invasive species and climate change. What way do they interact with the pollution that's entering the lake to make the blooms even worse? One example is Phragmites on the shoreline and how it might kill native species that act like as a, fil as a filter. Um, there's harnessing market forces to help farmers reduce nutrient runoff. So our farmers are important. They bring food to the table. Um, and we're trying to find ways that help incentivize them uh, to take the actions necessary on field. So an example of those would be planting riparian buffers, um, taking marginal land off and putting wetlands in place instead, uh, planting cover crops like alfalfa or switchgrass, changing the way that um, the cattle graze. These are all things that could be done on land. However, they are at an added cost to the farmers, so we're looking at ways to be able to improve the practices uh, without hampering what's a very challenging uh, task. Um, and one way, um, one thing that needs to happen is a little bit more investment in the Great Lakes. So the Environmental Commission of Ontario released a port earlier, uh, in, or towards the end of, uh, I guess it's, yes, 2016, um, towards the end of last year, um, saying that there needs to be more investment in the Great Lakes. One uh, point that they brought up was that Ontario recovers only 1.2% of 16.2 million it spends on water quantity management programs. So that's specific to water permitting programs. Um, but then again, there's other areas where we could be investing more. So one thing that you can do is as an environmental citizen, tell your MPPs, um, tell your MPs as well, or councillors to invest in safeguarding water and protecting the Great Lakes. Um, and this is, you can go in on Fridays when they tend to have constant days, you can write letters, sign petitions, but also be a bit more active in other ways as well. Tweet them, a lot of them have Twitter accounts. And now, we believe that everyone deserves clean water, but some are taking more and paying less. So with the example that I gave of the amount of money that the province isn't, being able, isn't able to recoup in the permitting program, uh, one of the challenges is that um, some types of industries, like water bottlers, only pay $3.14 to take a million liters of water a day. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit. And we think the water bottles are an unnecessary waste. So one of the new campaigns that we'll be launching very soon um, is about putting a price on plastic pollution. So not only does it take about a quarter of this to uh, produce the bottle, to transport it, to cool it, once these are produced, not all of them actually end up being recycled. Um, only about 50% in Ontario do, and a lot of them end up in our landfills where they can leach, or they end up in our lakes and our rivers, and these guys, they don't biodegrade, they just break down into smaller bits that can get eaten by fish and other wildlife, and then they make their way back up the food chain. So one thing that we're going to propose is the deposit return program. A lot of other provinces and jurisdictions in Canada have it, and it's going to be really effective, about 90 to 95% returns. We're already familiar with the system. We do it with our beer cans and our um, wine bottles. Uh, so imagine doing this with other types of beverage containers as well. And the benefit of this would be that it would help uh, fund 
pro programs like uh, to help implement the Great Lakes Protection Act, uh, to help meet our binational commitments. It would help fund programs to incentivize farmers to take action to protect Lake Erie, lead to improved waste diversion, as well as increasing jobs. So back to other things that you could do. Um, so all the previous panelists have given a lot of really great examples, um, and that's the challenge of coming at the end. Um, but a few more that you could do is uh, learn about water issues, so figure out where you can go down to the lake and where you can touch it. Be active in your community. Conserve water at home. If it's taking shorter showers or um, installing a rain barrel, be a water savvy tourist. Um, try to apply those same practices when you travel in places where there is more water scarcity. Use a refillable water container. Um, this is a really big one. We have really clean, safe, drinkable tap water that comes from Lake Ontario and that's treated, and instead we're buying bottled water. So I'm really happy that there's no bottled water here. Um, I didn't even have to say anything, so thank you, Taylor. Um, moving to non-toxic products, because microbeads and other things in our beauty products can get into the lake, and disposing of toxic substances properly. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. And thanks to all of our speakers. This is uh, so much interesting stuff. Um, I was thinking, I was struck by a lot of what you have said, but I was thinking, sorry, particularly, Chris, when you were talking about the incredible amount of water that's used in irrigation. Um, for one thing, I had no idea that turf grass was the largest crop in North America. <laughs> Um, and thinking through the lens of international development, when you hear about an irrigation system using 120 liters of water per minute, and then thinking about our sphere standards that dictate you know, a minimum of 15 liters of water per person per day sort of for sur survival, it really puts it in, in stark, uh, stark contrast. So just to, to get started, I'm going to open it up for questions in a second, but I guess listening, Chris and Lloyd, specifically to, to the two of you talk about sort of the business case for conservation, I'm wondering if you could, and, and, and others jump in as well, um, tell us a little bit more about what is the most effective sort of initiative that you've seen based on a business case or otherwise that, that has really uh, prompted change in clients or other people in the industry that you interact with? Is there a policy or an initiative that really stands out as, you know, that, that really made an impact? Should I go first? Sure. Okay. Uh, great question. Great question. I don't know if this is on. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's one thing. I'd say it's, uh, it's in the media. It's, uh, it's talked about at, Dinner parties, uh, you know, water rates are growing, uh, going up, not down, and all of these things combine, and and we're all, I think, as Canadians, becoming more educated uh, as to the value of the resource we have. Even though it is really undervalued in terms of what we pay, uh, we're starting to really value it. And all of the conversations that are going on globally with water scarcity, specifically south of the border, and Canadians' fear of our water going south, um, I think. It makes it easier when I reach out to a new prospective client. It makes it easier to have a conversation about water. So I wouldn't say it's one thing. I'd say it's a culmination of a lot of things. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think probably, I think Chris mentioned this in his presentation that increasing the water rates is a great way to start the water conservation conversation amongst businesses. And we've certainly seen, you know, years ago in our sort of work that we do, it was always about electricity, natural gas savings. And now slowly water is creeping up there as being on the radar of executives and of plant managers. Like, this stuff's getting expensive. We need to find better ways to use it. And I think there's also a lot of societal pressure that people are really more aware of water issues and how we need to conserve it. And I think that also puts some pressure on companies as well to be good water stewards. So from what we've seen, you know, there's some really easy ones like, you know, mechanical equipment makes a lot of heat and you want to take that heat away from the equipment or else it'll break down. And so they used to say, well, let's run water through it and, and run water to the drain at the other end and that's how we'll cool it. Now that's very uneconomical these days because the cost of water. So now they switch to like air cooling. So blow air on it and, to cool it instead. And we've also seen a lot of uh, behavioral things where I talked about the Timor's example of people with hoses. So we went to one facility where they, they'd have a, a process shut down fairly often. So all the employees would grab a hose and wash the floors because they wanted to look busy to their bosses. And so just explaining to them, like, 
that wastes a lot of water. And if you're not busy, that's fine. Just just stand there. You don't have to pretend you're busy by using water. So it's very often not a technological solution to water conservation. It's, it's a lot of behavior. And I think that's good because then it means all of us can, can have the same behaviors and, and take them home with us and also implement them at work as well. Great. Thank you. Um, let's open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, put your hand up and uh, one of our volunteers with the microphone will come and find you. Any questions over here? And please do wait until the mic makes its way to you. Thank you. Uh, that was really great to hear from all of you. So my question is about private companies. I live in Guelph and there's a big Nestle factory there. And uh, I'm really not sure actually what the laws are in Canada. I'm wondering if any of you can speak to that of what, like how much water can they take? Are, are there any limits on that? Um, does it seem to be going that way in Canada that water is becoming privatized? Yeah. Um, so in Ontario, the rule is that if you want to take more than 50,000 liters of water per day, you have to get a permit from the province. Uh, and that permitting process, if managed correctly, means that there's public notice, public consultation, public participation. If a permit is issued that has in some way violated participation rights or is fundamentally flawed for technical purposes, you have all the appeal rights that go with any kind of um, licensing in Ontario. So I think a lot of the issues uh, with the Nestle um, lo location that you're talking about is that there's a fundamental gap between what Nestle wanted and what the province was willing to approve and what people in the community wanted. So they may have received permits that were technically legal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the community supports uh, the decisions that were made. And so I think that's where a lot of the battle comes from. In terms of the, uh, you talked about the, the privatization of water. So, I mean, there's a lot of nuance there. There they're taking, they have a right to take the water that the permit gives them the right to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually own the water that's still in the ground. So uh, also when you talk about municipal water, you can have a private company that runs, say, a sewage treatment plant or a drinking water plant, but they don't necessarily own the water that's flowing through the pipes. Uh, so you're not seeing a lot of outright, quote unquote, privatization. We have sold the water, but you're seeing a lot of what are called public-private partnerships, where it's still a municipal or a government agency providing a service through a partnership with a public entity. Waterkeeper's view on that is that uh, it's the rules that govern that partnership that are more important than the ownership per se. Uh, there's an argument that some people make that if government doesn't own it, uh, then they're not in a conflict of interest, so they're more likely to actually enforce the rules because they don't actually own the facility. Government is not really trained, though. Uh, one of the challenges that we have in the 21st century is how do we be good managers of these these partnerships? How do we oversee public-private partnerships in a really effective way when traditionally government has just owned and run and managed everything? That's been the way that we, we've done things in Canada for 100 years. So there's definitely a skills gap that the public sector is talking about a lot. So there's a lot of flaws in the system. I think also, Natalia, you could probably speak a bit more to uh, how water is protected in, in NAFTA a, a little bit, because NAFTA is what speaks to protecting uh, the sale of, of, of Canadian water. But uh, I was just, I was going to comment um, on, uh, I think you, the question you asked kind of touched on another big uh, topic, which is bulk water exports. And it's not just Nestle. Nestle seems to be, or bottling companies in general, seem to be the lightning rod for privatized like privatization of water, but uh, there's a lot of water being shipped out of this uh, country through uh, embedded water in products and agriculture. Uh, there's actually a great article in uh, Corporate uh, Nights magazine recently, uh, and the Council of Canadians, which is, uh, I think, Maude Barlow's uh, organization, uh, says that there's about 70 billion liters a year of bulk water exports that is going out through products. So things we make, agriculture, uh, oil and gas, it, it's pretty shocking uh, that amount, uh, that amount is, and it's not just Nestle that is, is taking water out of watersheds. I don't work for Nestle, just want to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Great. N Natalia, did you want to jump in as well, or? Um, I don't you don't have to. I don't speak to NAFTA. Okay. Um, don't have that expertise, sorry. No worries, no worries. Um, other questions? Yeah, over here, so we'll just get a mic to you. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, so thank you for everything that you introduced to us. It was very enlightening. Um, I'm actually really happy that you touched on agriculture because that is the question that I had about water, being as a huge amount of water is embedded in the agriculture and um, the meat industry and things like that. So I'm wondering, especially in your activism, um, if you address those issues or is it kind of difficult to have that inter intersection in um, activism, kind of giving people too many things to be stressed about, I guess, <laughs> or aware about. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to touch on that and then pass it down as well. Uh, so 70% of the water that's consumed globally as well as domestically in Canada is used for agriculture. 70% of that water is used for meat production. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Personally, like I've made the decision to be vegetarian because I don't want to contribute to that, but that's a personal decision. At work, we tend to focus more on who's breaking the laws. Um, so we would look at more uh, factory farm practices, manure disposal practices, and uh, Lake Erie um, is an area where agriculture is a, is a huge concern as well, although I'm not sure. I don't think it's meat production as much in that region. Um, so definitely, if you are concerned about water consumption, and you're concerned about uh, and interested in how you're contributing to water consumption, globally, um, looking at what you're eating is uh, probably the most effective thing that you can do as a starting point. I'd like to echo Kirsten's comments, and likewise, in terms of our organization, we are not looking at advocating what you can do uh, individually in terms of your own consumption, but we do look at more systemic practices on the field um, that impact water quality, as well as water quantity, and what types of policies could be passed to strengthen the practices on the ground. Um, but again, the, the key point is understanding where the food you come, uh, that you eat comes from and what the environmental implications are. And different people have different ethics that they need to consider, um, be they how the animals are treated or um, what the environmental impact is, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's very much a personal choice. So sorry, I guess I miscommunicated a little. It's more so, is anything being done? Like, are you, do, do your organizations that you align with try to address those things and like monitor um, the water use that's being um, possibly wasted or leaked and whatnot in agriculture because I know that um, the system that you were bringing up that you showed us um, it was saving water in households but is the same system applied in our farms uh, yeah I mean the technology in the agricultural space for, for water application is advancing rapidly as well uh, because farmers are having to mothball farms because there's no water availability. So uh, technology, uh, yes, is, is making its way into that space as well. Uh, I'm not sure uh, where agriculture falls under the permit to take water uh, program. I think they would pro probably be, be included in that. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure the level of oversight uh, on the end uses of agriculture. I think most of the times it's not municipal water they're using. Uh, they're using it out of uh, drainage canals. You know, if you go up to the Holland Marsh, you can see sort of how, how they're doing it. They're pumping out of canals um, and irrigating that way. And to the question of how it's managed, um, not just in terms of how much they're consuming, but what's happening as a result of that. So one of the reasons why there's algal blooms is because there's a lot of runoff off of the farm fields, which you may already know about. I see that you're nodding. Um, so there are people that are looking at drainage and how drainage can change. Because for centuries, farmers have typically tried to flush that water off of the land as soon as possible to avoid water logging. So now in cities, we're looking at how can we soak up that water? How can we get rid of those impermeable surfaces? But on farms, that's a bit challenging, right? They're, they still have drainage tiles and they have the canals. Um, but what other methods are there to slow it down? So the riparian buffer areas um, are one example. Um, but then again, it really depends on the individual soils. And it's really difficult for us to come from the city to say, hey, you, you've been managing your land for five generations, but we think you should do this specific best management practice. Um, there's a lot of conversations that need to happen with soil scientists, with the farmers themselves, and others about what needs to take place on the farm. Thanks. Sounds to me like the take home here is to eat more donuts and less meat. Yes. <laughs> right? um, any other questions? We've still got lots of time. I see a hand back here. Hi. Uh, 
Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. Um, so I guess my question is mostly for Kristen, but anyone can feel free to answer. Um, so I grew up in a small cottage town that had a river running through it. My house was actually on the river, and so my brother and I often went swimming on the weekends and in the summer, and uh, very connected to this river source that ran through our backyard. Um, but I remember as I got into high school, it was sort of this notion that the water was dirty and the river was dirty and they had found a dead body in there not actually but that, that was always the rumor um, and so we never really talked about the fact that we love this river in our backyard um, and I know since getting to Toronto other people that I've talked to who like have grown up so also sort of have this disdain like it's dirty we don't go swimming in this parts of the the river the lake whatever um, so I can just wonder if you can speak to, do you think communities need to change their attitudes before anything happens, or maybe any experience you guys have had with like working towards convincing people that this is something that is not unsalvageable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first, I guess, shameless plug. If you uh, go to a new website that we launched two weeks ago called The Watermark Project, watermarkproject.ca. I would love if you contributed that story to the archive that talks about where you grew up and what that body of water means to you. Because um, it's a great, it's a really great story. Um, fun fact, if you go to a beach in Toronto and survey people, as we've done, they think beaches in Toronto are amazing. If you walk around outside of a beach, people think that they're scary and dirty places to go. So all you really need to do to show somebody how great the waterfront is, is just get them there once. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that's going to spend a day at the Toronto Islands that doesn't go, oh, this is kind of a, a great asset and a resource that our city has. So it's almost more of a cultural and a social challenge than it is anything else. If you have someone in your life that took you to the water and showed you a positive experience, you're going to have one type of connection or relationship to the water. If you just hear from a bunch of people that your water is dirty and contaminated and polluted, then you're going to have that perception of the water. So it's changing the narrative about how we talk about where we live. Um, we focus on that swimmable, drinkable, fishable thing because if people aren't using the water, a lot of the laws don't apply or a lot of the political will to enforce those laws don't apply. So in the case of the city of Toronto, we dump an astronomical amount of partially treated, treated or raw sewage into Lake Ontario every year. And the city has done that for decades largely because they don't realize that people are using the lake. Uh, and between 1996 and 2012, the percentage of Canadians going to the beach doubled Nearly half of Canadians go swimming, go to the beach at least once a year. That wasn't the case 15 years ago. So there's a huge resurgence of people wanting to spend time by the water. And a lot of our narrative and policy and political decision making hasn't caught up with what people are, are actually doing. So it's really up to us to just celebrate what we're doing and amplify it and talk about it a lot more. Question over here. Hello, it's been very interesting to listen all your perspectives. Uh, so my question goes uh, built on that cultural challenges that you're talking about. I'm not Canadian, obviously. And then uh, where I'm from, uh, we don't have green lawns. Like some places do, some places don't. You have your plant or your tree, whatever, you water them, and that's totally fine. So my question is, is according to you, is there any room to challenge uh, Canadians' uh, aesthetics about what a lawn should look like, what my house should look like? Do I really need to have a lawn in front of my house? Is there any use for it? Personally, I don't... I don't mind having a lawn or not. And after listening all the water that is wasted, it's actually quite shocking. Thanks. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. I'll speak to that one, the lawn guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I personally have noticed a change just in my neighborhood of, of what people, uh, how they maintain their lawn. It used to be you'd have two weeks of dry weather and all the hoses and the sprinklers would come out and be watering all over the place. And now people are, get, are hearing the message. The message from the water departments is that uh, grass can go dormant and it'll come back, and, and that's normal. So uh, I think the new normal for a lot of neighborhoods is, is brown lawns in periods of, of drought. Uh, I think Canadians actually do fairly well in terms of 
uh, how many people are buying irrigation systems. I would say probably less than 10% of residential homes in Canada have irrigation systems. Uh, it's, it's higher in certain markets like Vancouver or maybe Quebec where a large percentage of the population actually don't have water meters and they pay a flat rate as in their property taxes. Uh, but places like Texas and California, they're 98% irrigated. That's, if you think about that, that's every house that gets built gets an irrigation system because nothing will grow if, they d if it, it doesn't have one. So, um, yeah, I, I think there is an opportunity to challenge people's um, vision of what a landscape should look like. And the whole green law, there's, uh, there's a lot of books out there on this. That This came uh, after, I think, after the Second World War. That was the American dream, and the, the Scots... A uh, fertilizer company sold this dream of the green lawn and a white picket fence, and that was the start of kind of the lawn revolution. Uh, and um, uh, But I think people's attitudes are changing. And zero escapes, that's a, a terminology some of you might have heard, but that's sort of a, um, a drought-tolerant uh, landscape uh, design uh, practice. And, and a lot of landscapes now are being designed around different plant palettes or uh, municipalities locally have things called fusion garden programs where they're training people on to go consult with homeowners on how they can change their plant types or reduce their water use and but still have color etc so it's a good question i saw a tentative hand go up here <laughs> do you have a question um, yeah, sure. okay we need a, a microphone here and then afterwards we've got one across the aisle i was just gonna I was, my question was about the lawns. Um, I know on the, your front lawn you're not allowed to have um, agricultural practices and I'm wondering if that's gonna change in Canada because a lot of people are getting fined if they have like a little garden in the front of their lawn. So is there like a... Uh, I actually don't know a lot about um, bylaws in terms of uh, gardening. Okay. Uh, I know, uh, I mean I've seen a lot of community gardens and sometimes we, we help with those sort of endeavors. Um, but I don't really know. I, am, I imagine that people's mind, you know, mindset around locally sourced produce is, is, uh, is going to change. And mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I, I don't want to touch that one because I really don't know much <laughs> about it. Well, I know a lot of places in the States are doing it. Like there's the food is free movement where they do like they use all the space in their lawns to commute uh, to build these like agricultural things that they could share with their family. It brings a sense of community and. Um, I know that they're like, instead of using green um, space for lawns, they're like actually doing city like gardens and stuff where people like homeless can like go and take produce and stuff. So I don't know if that, mm -hmm. is it changing in Canada as well? But yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the removal of lawns topic is, uh, is uh, just like uh, privatization of water is very uh, controversial. I'm, I'm on the board of Landscape Ontario and uh, uh, Landscape Ontario wants to make sure that, that the message is, you know, we need green infrastructure. So I don't, I don't think it has to be a lawn, but it can be a garden. I mean, that is, to me is green infrastructure. We need green infrastructure to absorb uh, rainfall. Uh, and you don't have to maintain a lawn to a golf type standard. So I think all of those people's, uh, people's attitudes around that are changing. Mm -hmm. I don't think lawns are a bad thing and I don't think gardens are a bad thing either. Kristen, do you have something to add to that? Uh, just a small, if you're interested in that um, sort of urban agriculture piece, uh, the organization Not Far From the Tree, I think I'm getting that right, yeah. uh, is a great organization. So they find all the fruit trees in a neighborhood and uh, they go and they'll harvest the fruit that the homeowners aren't using. And uh, they do walking tours and all kinds of fun things and they have lots of volunteer opportunities too. Thanks. Thanks for the question. There was a question here as well, this gentleman. Uh, thank you. Um, as one of the older guys here today, and most of the discussion has, I think, with a fair degree of accuracy, been focused on the on the water quantity situation. I sit on a panel, or a, not a panel, the committee of the Halton Hamilton uh, Source Protection Committee, and most of our work has been on water qu quality. We also have done some work, at least the staff and so on have done some work on quantity. But I'm wondering, with a comment from the panelists, um, we currently have had in, in the last few years a great deal of difficulty of making any inroads with the general public as to concern about water qu quality. Will it take another Walkerton before we wake up to say, okay, we've got problems 
that can be solved, should be solved, must be solved. And I'm wondering from the group here, um, <laughs> is, is there concern about the quantity of water, or the quality, I keep getting mixed up here, sorry about that, about the qual water quality, the, uh, typical to the, you mentioned about problems of Walkerton, and this is what started this whole process. Um, all of the uh, source water protection committees now, I think, except there may still be two more to be finalized by the, or approved by the minister, but basically the work is done and now it's on to a, an implementation program. So anyhow, to get back to my question, what do you think about the problems we face in, in water quality? Will it take another Walkerton before the public wakes up again? Um, so thank you for the question. I certainly hope that it will not take another Walkerton. Um, one of the things that we try to do at ED is keep up that level of engagement about water quality issues and keep that conversation going. Uh, to the point about the source protection plans, all of them have now been approved. Um, so the next stage is how to implement them. Um, and part of that will also be building that awareness. So. One idea that I have heard floating around is putting up signs that say this is your watershed and this is the river um, that your water comes from. Something like that is so key because just grab someone on the street and ask them where their water comes from. Though it's Lake Ontario, a lot of people might not know how to answer that question. Um, so it's, it's also about having those conversations um, with our friends and our family members as well. And we've worked with, for example, Credit Valley Conversa Conservation. They've had some good programs where they chose a few industrial sites and did like a pollution prevention audits. So what's happening on the site that could potentially impact the quality of the water that's running off into the surrounding environment? And then they would put signs up as to what the measures were. They had a big tour so everybody could see them. So I think there are some smaller areas where that's that's being done but i certainly agree that that it, quality is something that that should have more emphasis on it as well from the industrial side again it's always focused on what's inside but what happens outside a company also um, is important because that's what affects the community a few years ago the provincial government had funding where they would fund these assessments to go out and look at um, a restaurant or look at um, you know, a manufacturer and see what's going on outside that could impact. Are they sto storing like oil drums on the ground without any secondary containment? Um, is there a way to integrate uh, permeable pavement into their parking lots and things like that? So I, I think there's some things being done, but I'd certainly agree with you that it'd be good if there are more as well. We've got time for one last question. This gentleman right here. Hello, thank you for being here and sharing your ideas. Um, my question is for Lloyd, yep. uh, gentleman to the left, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, perfect. Um, uh, it's regarding the program you were uh, talking about, and I just want to clarify, from, clarify some information first. You were mentioning um, businesses can reduce their water consumption, and then once they've shown they can reduce their water consumption, they get a reduction in the rate on the rest of the water they use. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if that program is also available for residential um, water users. We mostly work with industrial clients and commercial institutional. For residential, the City of Toronto, I, I'm not sure if these programs are active anymore, but they used to have like toilet rebate programs as well as some other fixtures, if, like washing machines or like clothes washers. If you switch from a top load to front load, there were some incentives that you would get. I'm not sure if those are active anymore because um, now even, even the building code prescribes you have to have a certain liter per flush toilet and you can't install anything higher. So I don't think those programs are as active anymore because they're so standard now. Um, I kind of think that's too bad. I think if they could think of another way to reach homeowners, that'd be great. Because like, industry uses a lot of water, but everybody goes home at the end of the day from that industry and uses water in their own personal space. So if you could also foster conservation and incentives for homes, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, just because uh, my understanding then is that industrial water users are paying a cheaper rate than residential water users. And you were mentioning the rate of water should go up to help create an incentive, but this is a reduction in the rate per liter. Um, and it's when paying collectively for the infrastructure for producing mm -hmm. water, then industry and businesses are paying less into that pool to do that, while residential is paying then more relative to business. I just wanted to point that out and then maybe advocate extending that to <laughs> residential water users as well who are using it for 
everyday life, like drinking and so forth. Absolutely. And that's been yeah. one of the things people Thank talk you. about Toronto's program is you're incentivizing people to use more water in a sense. And there, there's this struggle, right? Because Toronto really wants to retain business. They want manufacturers in Toronto and they want to attract more. So offering a 30% reduction in their water rate is a huge savings for companies, as I said in the presentation. But yes, you could say you're incentivizing people to use more water. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. People have made that before. Um, but yeah, it's what the program is and it is what they decided to do as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for your questions, everybody. And uh, we are running out of time, so I just wanted to wrap it up. Um, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that, for me, this has been totally fascinating. I thought I knew quite a bit about um, water issues and conservation issues, but I've definitely learned a lot today. Um, you know, Kristen, I, I loved the idea of the watermark story. Um, and I would encourage everyone to go to the website. And if you have, it's prompted me to think about how I grew up with water and, and I haven't been thoughtful enough about it, I don't think. So I'm going to try to think about what my water might, mark might be. Um, and then Chris, I learned a tremendous amount about lawns. <laughs> um, really, I, I don't think, I think a lot of us drive around the city and don't give much thought to what we see. Um, and um, I found it very, very interesting and fascinating to see what an impact you, these new technologies can have as well. So I think that that's something I definitely want to learn more about. Um, and Lloyd, similarly, thinking about um, the work that you do with industry and relatively simple audits and, and relatively simple changes that you and your company have advocated that have an enormous impact um, on, on water conservation um, and on donuts. Um, and then finally, Natalia, I think that it's been, it's been really interesting for me to hear more about some of the policy and legal frameworks as well around these issues. Um, and um, uh, definitely interested in, in following up as well on the new campaign around uh, the impact of water bottle production as well. Uh, I had never thought about sort of a return deposit uh, system. Um, and it's really interesting to hear that it's been so successful in other places. So that's something that uh, I look forward to following too. So a really a big thank you to all four of you. I think that was excellent. And again, another thank you to Taylor for bringing, bringing these folks together and to everyone who's come today and to all of the volunteers that have helped out. Thank you. I think before we let you run away, I think we do have some small tokens of our appreciation. Here we go, some small gifties from Humber. Hopefully there's no bottled water in there. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Want to pass them down? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. That was fun. Food, eat food. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.